In the last segment, I got into the notions of the stable and unstable manifolds, which are what give a chaotic attractor its shape. And that makes sense if you think about it, because things spread along unstable manifolds and converge along stable manifolds, and the spreading influence and the converging influence are what creates the bends and the folds of the chaotic attractor. If you have all stable manifolds and no unstable manifolds, you've got a fixed point because all the directions are converging. And that means that there's some sort of bowl in the landscape, although it may not be hemispheric or elliptical, it might have some very strange nonlinear distorted shape. But there's some sort of a valley, strangely shaped perhaps, that has a single point in the bottom to which any marble placed in that bowl will roll. And if you have all unstable manifolds, that's like having an upside down bowl in the dynamical landscape. Again, maybe strangely shaped. It's when you have a balance of the two effects of converging and spreading that things get really interesting. A periodic orbit and a continuous time dynamical system looks like this, or maybe this, or even perhaps this is what we might call a two cycle. Every two times around, it repeats exactly, kind of like the foxes and the rabbits in the logistic map. Issue here, that crossing. Remember, that's not allowed. In the kinds of dynamical systems that we're interested in, there can't be more than one downhill direction from a single point, and that means the trajectories cannot cross, and that looks like a crossing. So that periodic orbit really must be living in a three-dimensional state space, and we're viewing it from one side in projection. If this is an attracting periodic orbit, then trajectories will converge to it from all directions. That wouldn't happen unless there were some sort of dynamical shrinking that acts crossways to the periodic orbit, what's called a transverse stable manifold. In terms of the dynamical landscape, you can think of a periodic orbit as living in a groove. Imagine a hat with a brim and a ball rolling around just inside the brim of that hat. In side view, it might look like this. Here's the ball coming out of the page towards you and then going into the page away from you as it rolls around the back of the hat. This is the dynamical landscape that has to exist around an attracting periodic orbit. The orbit has an uphill slope around it. The fall line of that slope is the stable manifold. That's the green lines there. The steepness of the fall line is related to the Lyapunov exponent that is associated with that stable manifold. And as you saw, those manifolds can have very complicated shapes. They can even cross. So you can imagine their action performing a kind of kneading of the state space, much as we knead bread. And that's what creates chaotic attractors like this one. This is a single state space trajectory of a three-dimensional, nonlinear dynamical system called the Lorentz system. Here's where I started the trajectory. I generated that trajectory using a computer program that we'll talk about in the next unit. I didn't generate a really, really long trajectory, so it didn't cover the whole attractor, which actually has more stuff in here. It only went this far. Again, remember, trajectories in these kinds of systems are not allowed to cross. This is actually an object that's living in a three-dimensional space, and I'm showing you a two-dimensional projection here. So why is this particular system important? This was actually the first time anybody recognized chaos, although they didn't call it that. In the early 1960s, Ed Lorenz, who was a meteorologist at MIT, was playing with a system of differential equations and generating trajectories of their solutions. And he was the first to notice sensitive dependence on initial conditions. The fact that you start the system at a slightly different point, you get the same overall pattern, but traced out in a different order. Now, one of the things that's amazing to me about this is that in his time, it was thought that all deterministic flows had periodic behavior. And so the title of this paper was provocative and new and amazing. He was saying to the entire community that the dogma was wrong and that deterministic flows could have non-periodic solutions. So he had the scientific perceptiveness and scientific confidence to recognize novelty in the face of the dominant paradigm. Here are some scans from his paper. He did not have the benefit of modern computational technology in the early 60s, so his solution procedure used a very different computer, and his plots aren't quite as nice but they were enough for him to recognize sensitive dependence on initial conditions. So he started two trajectories a little ways apart, and they both traced out the same attractor. The equations that he was playing with look like this. 
For those of you who know about the Navier-Stokes equations, these are partial differential equations that model fluid flow, and Lorentz made a truncation of those to three modes. What he was modeling was a chunk of fluid being heated from below, and what would happen. And you've all presumably cooked, so you know what happens. Convection rolls form. The Lorentz system is a very coarse-grained model of this that uses just three state variables. How much the convection rolls are spinning, what the temperature is, and then a slightly odd state variable that has to do with nonlinearity in the vertical convection profile. The system has three parameters. The first one is a fluid dynamics property. The second one is what people mostly play with. It's related to how much heat you put in, that is how high the stove is turned up, and B is the aspect ratio of the fluid sheet. And what Lorentz did was solve these equations for a variety of values of these parameters and study the results. This particular result uses a equals 16, r equals 45, and b equals 4, and I've started this trajectory from the initial condition 1, 1, 1, that is x equals 1, y equals 1, z equals 1, and I've used an ODE solver that we'll talk about in the next unit. Again, this is a 2D projection. If you look at the thing in 3D, here's what you see. This is the beautiful structure of a chaotic attractor. What do you think will happen to the convection rolls if we turn up the heat? They get bigger, not surprisingly. That's because there's more convection. Flipping back and forth between these two slides, you can see the difference. Notice the vert vertical scales are different. What if we turn the burner down? The convection rolls die out. Now, what's with the red and the green? These are two different initial conditions, one here and one here that are in the basins of attraction of two different fixed points. So if I start the system at the red initial condition, it rolls down to the red fixed point, and the same thing with the green. So someplace between r equals 25 and r equals 45, there's been a bifurcation from a chaotic attractor to two attracting fixed points. If we continue to turn down the heat, the convection rolls die out faster and faster. Here's a movie showing what happens to the attractors in the Lorentz system as we raise R from about 23. See the fixed point moving up and the transient getting longer and longer and longer and longer. And then pop, chaotic attractor. That pop is the bifurcation. There are four kinds of attractors that turn up in dissipative nonlinear dynamical systems. And you've seen three of them today. Fixed points, periodic orbits or limit cycles, and chaotic attractors. The fourth type, quasi-periodic orbits, I'm not going to talk about very much in this course, but do be aware that there is a fourth type. Chaotic attractors they have several important features. Exponential divergence of neighboring trajectories is sensitive dependence on initial conditions. There is often fractal structure in these attractors. In this particular one, if you were to slice it crosswise along that red line, what you would get out is a canter set. A third important feature of these attractors, which we'll come back later, is that they are densely covered by trajectories in their basins. That is, look at the purple circle. If I stand on a point on a chaotic attractor and I draw a ball around my feet of radius epsilon, denseness tells me that the trajectory will eventually enter that ball. I may have to wait a while, but it will eventually get there. And as a final note, any point in the state space is in the basin of attraction of some attractor, but there's no way to know ahead of time where they are, what they look like, how many they are, and that's a real richness in these systems. The mathematics that we'll tackle in the next unit will set us up to approach that richness and that challenge a little bit more effectively.